John chapter 3, verse 34. <coughs> Before I read this verse, I just want to uh, say that uh, this lesson is in response to a question about uh, miraculous gifts and um, the problems of trying to prove that they no longer exist uh, in the present day. And uh, there's a lot of confusion out there and sometimes in the minds of the brethren as to how to, how to sort all of this out and how to explain it as simply as possible. Now, what I'm going to do today is uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to start off by showing you that uh, Christ received uh, the Holy Spirit without measure. Uh, I want to move on then to show that there was, uh, everybody else received the Holy Spirit by measure. What we've got, uh, first of all, predicted by the Gospel uh, by John uh, the Baptist, that uh, Jesus would baptize in the Holy Spirit. So we're talking about the baptismal measure of the Spirit, and we'll see how that applies uh, according to the teachings of the New Testament. Then we'll move on to discuss the idea of the laying on of hands measure. A bit, a bit long, but it's uh, simple enough to remember. The laying on of hands measure of the Spirit and the miraculous gifts that came through that. And then we'll talk about <coughs> the more simple uh, one, the one that we know more about, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and what that is all about. So that really just covers all the bases in the New Testament. And um, if you can get this clearly in your mind, it will help you then to, uh, to understand this subject and to be able to talk about it confidently uh, to others. Uh, in particular, I hope that you'll be able to use the scriptures that I've used to show uh, what these things are and how they affect us in the present day. In John 3, verse 34 now, he says, uh, For he whom God has sent speaks the word of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now, <clears throat> just reading that as it is in the New American Standard Bible, it would uh, seem to suggest that uh, God, uh, that Jesus whom God has sent speaks the words of God. That's understandable. And therefore, he gives the Spirit without measure. And it seems to suggest that Jesus gives the Spirit without measure. And the question you have to ask is, who did he give the Spirit to without measure? Um, because uh, if you had the Spirit without measure, you are God. You couldn't but be God with the Spirit without measure. Uh, and that poses a question then, is, is this what this passage is? Well, as I look through the Greek um, um, Bibles and uh, interlinears, um, some of the very earliest forms have it, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without measure. And that tied in, that made more sense, particularly in view of what it says in the next verse, the Father loves the Son, and has given all things into his hand, indicating that uh, the all things included the spirit as well as everything else. Um, so what, we, what I am satisfied to say is that uh, we could put this, for he who God has sent speaks the word of God, for God gives the spirit without measure to him, that is to Jesus. And I think that's exactly what the verse is teaching me. Okay, <clears throat> if that be the case then, Jesus is the only one who would have received the Spirit of the Lord. Everybody else, everybody else is going to receive the Spirit of my measure. So let's look at this, the baptismal measure of the Spirit. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 3 and in verse 16, Now while the people were in the 
state of expectation, and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ. John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the tongue of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. People often ask, I understand what the Holy Spirit is, but what is the fire? Well, I think the very next verse tells us what the fire is and how Jesus will baptize people with fire. It says in verse 17, His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The fire is not something that is added to the Holy Spirit to make it more heated or uh, more potent or whatever else. The fire is something separate from the Holy Spirit. He's talking about on one group of people he's going to bring salvation and on another group he's going to bring damnation. That's what he's talking about. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is this blessing which will be poured out in order that people can be saved uh, and in order that people can have the gifts of the Spirit. And then the uh, baptism of fire, or the uh, total immersion in fire, is hellfire. That's what he's talking about here. So John looks forward to the fact that Jesus is the one uh, who is going to uh, give this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I believe in John chapter 1, Yeah. 
16 and in verse 13. He says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Not just part of the truth. He says, all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I say that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. The Spirit was to not only bring to their remembrance everything that Jesus had said and teach them all things, but he says that, that here that he will guide them into all truth. Now if that promise is has been fulfilled, then by the time the last apostle died, all truth was revealed. Listen to that. There's no traditions to be added to the truth that has been revealed to the apostles. They had all truth. And we have a record of that truth which they have been given. It is here in the New Testament. We don't need to go in to, 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 we don't need to go anywhere else but to the Bible. Nothing is to be added to it, nothing is to be taken away from it, because it's the truth that pertains to life and godliness, it is the truth that will lead us to salvation. So if we've got all truth, when we come to facing a problem or a difficulty that we, uh, that we have in our lives, or that confronts us in our minds even. Our attitude should be, well, if all truth is revealed in the scriptures, somewhere in that word is the answer to this problem, this difficulty. Somewhere in the scriptures is God's thinking, God's mind, God's will on this subject. And if I am a Christian, if I'm really a Christian, if I really want to serve Jesus Christ my Lord, if my life is dedicated to Christ, and I say all these ifs to get you to start asking yourself the question, am I? Am I really a Christian in this matter? Do I seek the will of the Lord? Or do I seek the will of others, or worse still, my own will? Because if I seek the will of Christ, I have got the answers to all my problems. All truth is here at my fingertips. That's a wonderful thing. In Luke chapter 24, just before he ascended into heaven, Jesus told the apostles to wait in Jerusalem.
speaking Galileans, how is it that we each hear them in our own language in which we were born? That that's what the crowds were saying. That was their response to what they saw. That was this great mighty rushing wind, so great a sound that uh, people gathered together to see where it was coming from. There were the tongues of fire resting on each of the apostles. And then there was this, uh, this new ability to be able to speak in foreign languages, to be praising God in languages that they had never learned or never known. And the people who were there in Jerusalem from all parts of the world could hear them speak in their own language. I guess sometimes you think, well, was there miraculous hearing as well as miraculous speaking? My own view of this is that well, if, if you were, uh, say, in a tour group, and you were with many different nationalities who were in their own tours, and everybody comes together in the beginning uh, of the tour, and the tour guides stand up, and they all start to speak in their own language, calling the people to them who are from Spain, or who are from America, or who are from Africa, or whatever else, and all speaking in, in those languages, your ear gravitates towards your own uh, language, you, you, to what you understand. And I reckon then the crowd sorted itself out, the, those who paired in uh, Aramaic came to the Aramaic speaking one, those who, who were speaking in Latin, they came to the, the one who spoke the Latin, and they divided into groups, and they were hearing them speak in their own language, and praising God. Uh, at this time. This was the baptismal measure of the Spirit. Now some people think because Peter quotes from Joel chapter 2 in verse 17, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my Spirit on all mankind. That they read into that that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was for all, for everyone, for all of mankind. But the reality that we find in the scriptures is that there are only two <laughs> recorded baptismal measure of the Spirit. There are only two occasions when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was recorded for us. The one is here in Acts chapter 2, and the other is in Acts 10 and Acts 11, which is the household of Cornelius. So, the Bible itself suggests it was for all nations representatively in the apostles and in the household of Cornelius, in the, in the apostles who represent the Jews and in the household of Cornelius who represented the Gentiles. So, so that was the way God fulfilled it and therefore that is the way it is. We can argue, well then God has contradicted himself. God doesn't contradict himself. Your misunderstanding what God is saying. Just take the facts as they are and go with it. Right, how do we know that Acts chapter 10 and 11 where the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or the baptismal measure of the Spirit. Well, let's go to Acts chapter 10.
consciously. Peter realized in the household of Cornelius that God is no one to show respect for persons, but in every nation the one who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Now given that this man is still spoken of as one who feared God with all his household, his name and his people and prayed daily, you'd ask yourself the question, is this man lost or is this man saved? And when I've been studying with people uh, who don't know much about the gospel, and you ask them, well, what would you think of this man? Would you say he's saved or lost? And they'd say, he's saved. And the reason why they're saying that is because they want to feel that anybody who is a good person is saved. But the truth of the matter is, he certainly was a good candidate for salvation. But he hadn't yet known about Christ, he hadn't yet accepted Christ, and he needed to have the blood of Christ sprinkled on his conscience to cleanse him from all his sins. Otherwise, he could never be saved. When Peter was recounting to the Jews when he came back to Jerusalem, what happened here in the household of Cornelius in chapter 11? It says, beginning with verse 12, the Spirit told me to go with them without misgiving. These six brethren also went with me, and we entered the man's house. Now, he only did this because of the miracles uh, that had taken place and the directive of the Holy Spirit. He saw that sheep coming down from heaven, all sorts of unclean animals, according, unclean according to the Old Testament, and he was asked to arise Peter and feel that he, Peter was hungry and when he fell into this trance. So naturally enough his mind turned to food and this is the way God uh, spoke to him. And Peter says, never eat anything that is unclean. And this happened three times and it perplexed Peter as to what, what was going on here. Then he had these messengers from Cornelius who had seen an angel. They were at the gate and they were asking for him. And uh, they explained why they were there, that an angel had talked to Cornelius and sent them to ask for Peter, who would be able to tell him the by which they would be saved. So here he is. He went with them without misgiving. Now he brought witnesses. Six other brethren went with him to witness and to see that everything was okay. Because Peter knew, wise man that he was, there's going to be questions about this. I'm going to get into trouble for doing this, uh, but it's God that's telling me to do it, so I'll do it regardless of what trouble comes out of it. Anyhow, it says in verse 13, and he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here, and he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. Listen to that verse again. He will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. He had to hear the gospel to be saved. He had to understand that Christ had died for his sins in order to be saved. He had to believe in Jesus Christ, repent of his sins, confess Jesus Christ and be baptized for the forgiveness of his sins before he could be saved. Good people are not saved just because they're good. Good people are never good enough to get into heaven. Therein lies the problem. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the problem for us humans. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And if we want to be judged by the Ten Commandments, then we're going to be condemned separated from God for all eternity. Which one of the Ten Commandments have you not broken? Think about it. Which one have you not broken? Honor your father and your mother? I think we've all transgressed on that one. Thou shalt not lie. We're not to covet our neighbors. 
neighbor's wife or neighbor's ox or donkey. I know we're not in the farming business right now, but uh, let's put it into his, uh, his Maserati or his, uh, <laughs> or whatever good thing that he might have. Are we covetous? Yeah, Paul says, I wouldn't even know the covetousness was wrong, except the law says that it was wrong. So here, here we are with this uh, situation. Poor people do not automatically get a free pass into heaven. There is no free pass into heaven. Everybody has got to come through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? It's contained here in the word of God. When I was a Catholic, I thought it was contained in the Catholic Church and the Catholic traditions. I have to learn from the Word of God that that's not the case that is contained here in the Word of God. And as a Catholic, I always wanted to do what God wanted me to do. I thought I was right. I listened to that. I thought I was right. But I came to find that God was right and that I needed to listen to God and God's word in order to be saved. <clears throat> anyway, I don't want to get off from that, but we'll, uh, we'll come, maybe come back to that at another stage. In verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. Very significant. In order to relate... <sighs> to what happened in the household of Cornelius, he has to go right back to the beginning. That's a good 10 years or more of history between what happened at the beginning and what was happening here in the, in the household of Cornelius. There was nothing akin to it from that time to this time. And we'll see when we get into the laying on of the hands measure of the Spirit why that was so long. There was nothing akin to the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Peter could appeal to to say, this is that which happened to us at the beginning. Or like that which happened to us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He applies that prediction that John made in Luke 3 and in verse 16, to the events that were taking place in the household of Cornelius. He says this is a fulfillment of that. Just like it was a fulfillment of it in the beginning when the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost. Now, it doesn't say that there was a mighty rushing wind or tongues of fire. All it says was they immediately started to speak with, in other languages, Praising God and uh, thanking God. In verse 17, therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as He gave to us after the of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? This is Peter speaking now. And when they heard this, they pointed down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also repentance that leads to life. <clears throat> they believed, they repented, they were ready then to be baptized. And they were baptized. So here's, here's the point that I'm trying to make. To record it, occasion, or two occasions that have been recorded for us in which the baptism of the Holy Spirit was given. Only two, no more. 
church, right back in the beginning, not everybody could speak in tongues. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit was for everyone in that sense. It was for the Jews and for the Gentiles, and was the promise to be fulfilled when the household of Corinthians and the apostles were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay? The significant thing about this baptism is it came directly from heaven without any material to it. The next baptism, the laying on of hands measure, had to have an intermediary. We'll see that now. Everyone kept feeling a 
sense of uh, many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Thanks, Mark. That's what we're talking about. All right, so we have Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, and Acts chapter 5 saying that they were the ones that were worth the hearing. But interestingly, in Acts chapter 6, remember they, they had a problem with the, the widows, and they appointed seven men to serve the tables. Alright? Now, if, if you look at uh, these seven men in verse 5, the statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, out of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicarna, Timon, Arminus, Nicholas, and Proselyte from Antioch. Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of faith. But it says in verse 6, And these were brought before the apostles, and after praying they laid their hands on them. Now skip verse 7 and go directly to verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs of Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone from whom I lay my hands may 
received the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to them, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not the of God. So, here we've, here we've got it now. The ordinary way of receiving the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit from Pentecost on all was the laying on the hands of the apostles. It was the laying on the hands of the apostles. And that's a very important for us to see. There are other passages like uh, Acts chapter 19, verses 2 to 7, when he went to Ephesus and he found these people who had been baptized in the baptism of John. They didn't even hear that there was such a thing as the Holy Spirit. So he told them that John expected them to be baptized in the baptism of Jesus, which they were baptized in, and then they laid their hands on them and they received the miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. This was the laying on of hands and measure of the Spirit. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, Paul reminds Timothy that he had laid his hands on him and that he had a gift as a result of that. Now, when the same of hands measure was given, it, it, it doesn't seem, as we've already seen from our quote from First uh, uh, Corinthians 12, that everybody had all the gifts. It didn't work that way. Each one was given a, a gift, whether it was healing, whether it was uh, faith, or whatever the gift was, they received the gift. And they needed to use that gift in order to benefit the whole church. And as we know, many of the revelations about the gospel came through the miraculous gifts. And that was their purpose. The purpose was to confirm the word that was preached. To confirm it as the word of God. There is another measure which is spoken about in, in Romans chapter 8. It's called the indwelling. It comes from the King James Version. Indwelling. He says in verse 9, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to you. In verse 11, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you, or indwells you, as the King James has it. Uh, verses 15 through 17. And you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified. When did we receive the Spirit? Well, Peter tells on the day of Pentecost, prepare to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We receive the, Holy, the gift of the Holy Spirit in baptism when we were forgiven of our sins. We became a new creation now that the Spirit dwells in us. We were raised to walk in that newness of life when we were raised up out of baptism. In Galatians chapter 3, he asks uh, these pertinent questions with regard to uh, the Spirit. Uh, let's just look at Galatians chapter 3. He says, you foolish Galatians, he was trying to get them to see how far they had strayed. From the truth. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Well, the promise was for those who have heard the gospel and who would obey the gospel. So it was with the hearing with faith. And even for the miraculous measure of the gift of the Spirit, the laying on of hands measure, he says uh, in verse 5, So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Again, it only comes through the gospel, not through the law of Moses. Indicating that both the indwelling of the Spirit and the laying on of hands measure of the miraculous Spirit uh, were given to
to the Christians, not under the law, but under the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think we can see then, um, it's pretty straightforward. The, the fruits of the Spirit uh, are the evidence that the Spirit dwells in us. Uh, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness. Uh, all of those gifts of the Spirit should be manifested in your life. There's probably 